After looking at the response to Chernobyl and Three Mile Island and Fukushima and more than 50 other significant reactor accidents we've had around the world in the last 50 years, is that there is a, a common thread. And I've described it as hubris, denial, and deception. This is the response to nuclear risk. You begin with denial. Our technology will never fail, even though you know it leaks. Well, there's a saying within the nuclear engineering community, and it's, it's very brief but very telling. Among themselves, they agree. They, they have this statement, nuclear energy can be safe. Nuclear energy can be clean, just not at the same time. That's the hubris. Yeah. Now, when the hubris fails and there's an accident, you get into denial. And you saw this at all at Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, and, and uh, Fukushima. Initially, the government says, no problem. Uh, it took uh, almost nine years before uh, the TMI owners admitted that there had been a partial meltdown in the plant. Uh, the um, the um, uh, third phase is, uh, is deception, when it becomes obvious that there is a problem, when people downwind start picking up radiation traces and say, where is this coming from? Uh, then you get into deception. Okay, we have it under control. In Japan, it's look at the radiation monitors, which they took forever to install, shows there's no problem. This place, figure in air, is 13.05 microsieverts per hour. Tell me a while back that he saw the China Syndrome that you know, 32 years ago or so, and that made him become an anti-nuclear activist. So if you haven't seen the China Syndrome yet, you better go see it. But um, what, a, what, a, what extraordinary dedication Dave and others have had for all these decades when so many Americans became complacent, enough that young Americans didn't know there was anti-nuclear activism um, after Three Mile Island that kept new reactors from being uh, built here. And so what I, my title, Where Are the People, as actually, was actually the title given by Dave, it was also assigned to the first panel this morning, and it comes from a moment of sheer um, well, puzzle, puzzled rage. And I felt, now, you know, among the people terribly, terribly upset about Fukushima are the nuclear industry, right? They, on this campus, about a month after Fukushima, there was a very big deal dog and pony show by, put on by Argonne National Laboratory. And um, you knew it was a big deal because the refreshments were really expensive. <laughs> much than anything that humanists would put on. And um, I was very struck that there was never any mention of the impact of Fukushima on human beings. And I remember I asking about um, labor. You know, what was going to happen? The Soviet Union was a command economy at that time. It could just order people to, have to deal with the Chernobyl catastrophe. Japan can't do it in the same way. And one of the experts on the panel said, so you just throw more money at them. So there was, there was that mention of human beings, right? They're susceptible to having money thrown at them. And then there was another one, this one possibly even more august, uh, sponsored by the American Academy of Sciences, of the Sciences, where a number of our experts participated. And it was after that, I, had, I just turned around to David and said, there are no people. None of them is ever thinking about human beings. And so, therefore, the title in my assignment. Um, so, I, so all of that damage control on nuclear power, on nuclear power, was being done here uh, in the days and months after Fukushima. And the fact that human beings went unaddressed, I think, was not accidental at all. In fact, if you go back to the very beginning, um, the nuclear age has required thinking, either bracketing human beings altogether, identifying a portion of them as expendable, or both. And so 
that's what I want to talk about a little bit and then go on to think about the human impact of Fukushima and on all of us. Um, in some ways, um, talking about expendability, uh, we heard very, very powerful uh, present presentations this morning from Native Americans and talking about how their homelands have been desecrated and made dangerous for everyone. Um, and, and the generations uh, past and to come as well. And the kinds of language you see um, when you go back to the early Cold War days, um, the AEC, the Atomic Energy Commission, for example, referred to downwinders in the American Southwest as, quote, low-use segment of the population. Um, another quote from an Atomic Energy um, Commission official, quote, Nevada is a damn good place to dump huge razor blades, close quote. Or, um, one of the things that, that's been interesting to see is that you can employ people in the nuclear industrial complex, or you can have, as the U.S. military or workers at plants, you can just use them that way and you can dispose of waste that way. You can really double your profits if you manage to make them experimental subjects as well. Right? You, you use the people that you dumped on and you produce and generate scientific data. And I'm not saying that scientific data isn't important. On the contrary, I think it is. But the kind of this vicious exploitation is, is very hard to, to tolerate. So this one is an example that comes from the Marshall Islands. I hope many of you know about extensive U.S. atmospheric testing in the Marshall Islands and how devastating that was for Native peoples there. Um, now this is somebody from the Advisory Committee on Biology and Medicine of the ABC saying, uh, speaking on the benefits of studying the impact of testing in the Marshall Islands, quote, now data of this type has never been available. While it is true that these people do not live, I would say, the way Westerners do, civilized people, here's, here's the punchline, it is nevertheless also true that these people are more like us than mice. More like us than mice. Thank you for volunteering your bodies. It's interesting that um, on the Marshall Islands, their, their uh, national day, um, once they gained independence, so to speak, the ambassador from the United States comes and thanks the Marshallese people for having contributed to the freedom of the world. Okay, and in some ways, if we go even back to the dropping of the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, there are people who say, uh, people none other, for example, than the French feminist, great feminist writer Simone de Beauvoir and her novel The Mandarins, who say, in, in after after VE Day has taken place, they, they, the Americans would never have dared to drop this up front. And there are other, I have met African Americans who lived through that period, New Yorkers who said, oh, we said that to each other all the time then. Be that as it may, we also have to remember, part as, as was referred to briefly this morning, there were atomic scientists here who tried really, really hard to foresaw the dropping of the bombs on Hiroshima. And um, Leo Szilard, for example, made extraordinary efforts. And if you want to look further into this, Google the July 17th petition of the Manhattan scientists. I think that is important also because uh, many people will say, well, they didn't, they, the scientists and the politicians didn't really know what the impact was going to be. They didn't know. They knew enough to try frantically to try to stop it. Um, so, uh, there's that, and, and, and it's, it's a strange kind of disconnect we see in that kind of endeavor, the, the effort to start up world government because the Manhattan's are the atomic scientists felt the danger of the bomb, thought it couldn't be trusted to one nation, they fall victim to McCarthyism and red purging. And then we just go into the Cold War mode, it seems. Now, then there's another category of subjects, human subjects, does anyone here know about the House sub Subcommittee Report dating from 1986? It's titled, American Nuclear Guinea Pigs, Three Decades of Radiation Experimentation on U.S. Citizens. Does anybody know about this? Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful, huh, it's a very, very valuable document, I think. The subcommittee was chaired by Ed Markey. 
And he was reporting to John Dingell, who is still representing some of the people of Michigan in Congress. And I just looked through it um, to pick out some examples of University of Chicago involvement. I guess we'll focus on where we are. Um, one of the examples I found was as part of the Manhattan Project between 1945 and 1947 was not just the University of Chicago, but Oak Ridge in Tennessee, Strong Memorial Hospital in Rochester, University of California in San Francisco, 18 patients who are, quote, injected with, injected with plutonium to measure the quantity retained by the human body. Were they told? Absolutely not. Of course, Plutonium, I, I learned through reading this, that plutonium was a word that could not be used during the war. Um, these were people who were selected because their physicians thought they had illnesses that left them with fewer than 10 years to live. And I think, are you kidding? Do you think 10 years is nothing to a human being? Anyway, um, and, and as it turns out, some of them died in five years, some of them died in 20. But certainly they were not informed, and their survivors and perhaps some, some of other, yeah, other survivors and some of them were involved only in 1974. This next one is in some ways, um, it's, I think it's very revelatory because I've been talking about expendable subjects. And I think one of the things we have to remember is that there are people who are minorities, uh, people in weak positions, economically vulnerable people who can be singled out as expendable. But, well, it's like Bonhoeffer, was it Bonhoeffer talking about, you know, if, when the Nazis come for so-and-so, I didn't stand up, and finally they come for you. You, you realize that we are all um, human, subjects of human experimentation in the nuclear age. But this one is between 1961 to 63, taking place at the University of Chicago and Argonne National Labor Laboratory, 102 human subjects. Now, who might they be? The subcommittee report says students and researchers, staffs, some of whom are labeled volunteers, under two human subjects. Now, if you're an undergraduate and your professor asks you to take part in, in, in an experiment, would you be able to say no if you were the secretary to a researcher? Now, why did the researchers experiment on themselves? One could ask. They didn't, um, as far as I know. Okay, what was done with these human subjects? They were fed um, real fallout from the Nevada test site. <laughs> Simulated or simulated fallout particles that contain strontium, barium, or cesium, or solutions of strontium and cesium. This experiment was uh, designed to measure human absorption and retention. I'm quoting here: human, human absorption and retention of these radioactive substances. The Department of Energy reported no long-term medical follow-up on these subjects. A scientific paper was published, I think, in '64 or so, but Apparently, no, no effort to follow up on these people. I've been talking a bit about expendable populations, and I always think about um, the Cuban psychiatrist that a bunch of us who uh, went with the Al wonderful Alison Bowden, former dean of Rockefeller Chapel, to on a University of Chicago trip to Cuba, 2004. This Cuban psychiatrist said about HIV/AIDS. Cuba had a distinctive experience. They were excoriated in the Western, and I remember the Japanese press, for, for hurting AIDS and HIV patients. Um, we do have another word for it, which is quarantine, but that wasn't the word applied in the case of Cuba. Anyhow, and then Cuba goes on after a period of great suffering to, to develop retrovirals on their own steam. This physician said, the experience of dealing with AIDS, HIV patients, taught us something fundamental about society. That whenever there is a crisis, the vulnerable suffer more. All of us suffer, but the vulnerable suffer more. And I think what has happened in Fukushima, in Chernobyl, and the many other sites of nuclear production and experimentation, whether they have resulted in disasters that can't be concealed or not, whether it's much more subtle, I think what's happened is irreparable and irreversible, given the nature of radio radioactive substances. And I think the question that is before us today is, is it irredeemable? What can we do to redeem the, the profound, lasting injuries we have done to our, 
as Al Gore said at the end of his movie, our only home, the Earth, and to our fellow living creatures. And um, uh, Jeff Patterson today um, quite em emphasized, he had a couple of triplets, but um, the one I want to bring up now, secrecy and um, deception, um, cover-up, minimization, secret, secrecy, cover-up, minimization. Um, when, when, when authorities are dealing with nuclear incidents. I think that that is what gets us to, to this point, that nuclear power, weapons and energy, both, threatens us fundamentally as biological and social beings. And going back to the title that Jamie Crab gave me, people, where are the people, let's not forget that democracy has a root, the Greek word demos, which means the people. Nuclear power is incompatible with we the people, with any genuine notion of democracy. So before I explore some of these issues further, I want to dispose of one common question quickly. I found many people ask, saying to me after Fukushima, in Japan and all places, they've already suffered once. How could it possibly happen there? Well, as in other places, it's not that special in that sense. It's just that there was a little extra labor that had to go in. One is that, in, in, a, in a neutral way, the scientific experiment imperative that the Japanese scientists, physicists, and indeed even very progressive physicists, liberals and leftists, who had known about the nuclear experimentation that surged before the war and who were eager to resume it after, after the war, that desire to know. So all, Oftentimes, we are somehow made to think that scientists are very special people. And if they want to know something, if they want to find something else, out, they uniquely are entitled to having that desire of knowledge and stuff. Why? Uh, that's one thing, scientific uh, imperative. Um, the other one, of course, is, is something that's come up, up a lot today, Adams for Peace. And we all know how nuclear war was conceptually normalized under President Eisenhower. Um, through that program, but for Japan, there was even a reasoning amongst American officials that because of Hiroshima, therefore, nuclear technology was owed by these people. That it was indeed a Christian task to impart this technology to Japanese. Um, and, and that Japanese people, on the other hand, on the receiving end, had to be gotten over what was patronizingly called by Japanese who were eager to promote this technology, had to be gotten over their nuclear allergy. And, and gotten over it, they were. There was all the talk of bringing wealth, you know, too cheap to meter, um, wealth to depopulating communities, so forth and so on. The, the same dreary and dreadful pattern of seduction happened in Japan too. And another one that I think is very important, um, a number of you might have seen um, an op-ed in the New York Times with Frank von Hippel, whose name came up today, and a, and a Japanese writer a few days ago called Japan's Nuclear Mistake, in which um, the authors say it's not good for pro proliferation reasons for Japan to continue to rely on nuclear power, but, but quickly dismiss the possibility that Japan would veer from its anti-nuclear weapons policy. But it is clear to many people, experts who study this, that the attraction of nuclear power, nuclear energy in Japan, as elsewhere, has been that it could be a latent nuclear weapons power. And in fact, um, from our, the former um, lamentable, but not lamented, governor of Tokyo, who's now left that position to run for national political office, started with a group, just said, because he was aligned with an almost equally unpleasant person, um, new power, um, Roger Hashimoto from Osaka, that they had, he had made a big thing about distancing himself from nuclear power, and former governor she had just said, I'm going to make them take that out of the party statement party platform because we Japanese cannot afford to give up on the possibility of the weapons power. So people shouldn't be sanguine about um, Japan and its uh, nuclear weapons ambitions. Um, also, just one other thing, people have also often said to me, Japanese people don't protest, and we've seen over the summer that that's not true. But it was also true a long, long time ago. 
And um, for example, in 1950 with the Stockholm Appeal, some of you may know about this, right? Um, there were 273.5 million signatories worldwide, 6.4 million in Japan, and 3 million in the U.S. So those who became uh, uh, involved in signing this appeal to ban nuclear weapons think of this as a crime against humanity, were quickly red purged under the occupation. Um, in March 1954, it was the Lucky Dragon incident, and housewives, housewives, in one war in Tokyo, um, launched an anti-nuclear campaign and, and gathered 32 million signatures. 1954 is well before social media. So another thing, maybe there is something to be said about face-to-face -face contact and bringing your clipboard and talking to individuals. And it's really an extraordinary number, which the current movement has not been able to achieve in that they were trying to get 10 million signatures. Uh, by April, was it? Now it's just been extended, and I think it's a 70 or 80, uh, uh, 10 million, and it's now at 60, 600, uh, 6 million, million or so. Okay, um, back to secrecy. Uh, the United States occupation, well, the United States having dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, then proceeds to have pretty much a unilateral rather than allied occupation of uh, which was very, turned out to be absolutely uh, significant for the future that uh, post-war Japan would have. Um, but it, the occupation forbade any dissemination of information or images of the atomic bombs. Right? So people were not, they, they could not talk about, they couldn't publish anything on it. There's a lot of great deal of censorship that went on in the, under the occupation that was all about bringing American liberal values to this until ever so recently in a new fascist country, but Soviet. Um, I, I remember those years well, and this is in a way how I come to be before you today, was that my father was part of the U.S. occupation. My mother was a woman, Japanese woman. Uh, he met and married in that context, fought a lot at the breakfast table about U.S. atmospheric testing. My father said it was absolutely necessary because, because of those commies. And my mother, who was an Anne Stevenson Hall, was absolutely horrified. And since I knew then already that my mother was right and my father inevitably and necessarily wrong, um, I kind of was set on the right path on the nuclear issue very early on. And I want to share with you a poem that is in your packets, but it's, it's the place I often return to to think about the nuclear issue. It was a poem written just about that time, right at the end of the occupation, when the first images of the atomic bomb, of the victims, in other words, the people on ground zero, remember the Smithsonian 17 years ago now, would not allow an exhibit um, which showed the experience of the atomic bombs on the ground. So they ended up with a refurbished um, Enola Gay. Now, what a complete way to learn about the impact of the atomic bombs is to just to have the Enola Gay there. So this poet, a woman, um, this was a very, very heady time in Japan when so much that had been, been crushed during the war years and ended even under the occupation was coming to light. So in the context of the union movement, um, marking of the anniversary of Hiroshima, she showed up at work and was told to produce a poem. So this is her poem, having just seen the first um, image of an atomic bomb victim. Upon seeing a photograph of an atomic bomb victim, ah, uh, this burnt, oozing face of August 5th, 6th, 1945, belonged to someone in Hiroshima at that moment. One of the 250,000 burnt, oozing things no longer of this world. Even so, my friend, let us look once again into the faces we have turned toward each other. Faces without a trace of the flames of war. Faces of today, radiant with health. Morning fresh faces. When I search there for the expression tomorrow could bring, a shudder passes through me. The earth holds several hundred nuclear weapons. How will you walk the abyss between life and death? Can you be so serenely beautiful? Hush, 
and listen. Can you hear something coming? What needs to be seen is before your eyes. What needs to be chosen is in the palm of your hand. 8.15 a.m. comes around every day. That morning of August 6, 1945, all those 250,000 people who died instantly were, like you, like me, serenely beautiful, caught off guard. So the title of the poem actually is Greetings. Greetings to each other. Greetings to this face of a once beautiful young woman, so transfigured. Um, for many years, when I read this poem, I was transfixed by this posing of a moment. Focus on the sharp divide between before and after, right? Robert Chavez gave a very powerful talk to us today about turning on the towel, getting drops of fresh water, taking, breathing in fresh, filling your lungs with fresh air. So I, while I read this poem, is that, and especially after Fukushima too, the moment before that, you can just turn on the water in your kitchen, and you can drink it, quench your thirst as much as you want, and, drink, and breathe deeply, fill your lungs. And the moment after, you can't do that. So I was, I've been caught on that moment. Um, and, and think about you know, the moment before crisis when life is forever transformed. And ask myself, what precipice are we sitting on the edge of now? And I don't mean the physical cliff. Or with this mountain of waste. But in thinking about this conference, I've begun to think more and more about how that divide might not be so sharp, and how the moment of being off guard can extend for months, years, decades, including after as well as before crisis. And in the first place, the crisis itself may be invisible, like radiation. As long as there isn't a bombing, like Hiroshima and Nagasaki, or the atmospheric test, or a quote-unquote accident, this Three Mile Island, which went all over Fukushima. So, as kinds, I, I come to think that there are many kinds of being off guard. Some of which are, for example, the condition of living with a nuclear power or reprocessing plant, of, in the case of Japan or elsewhere, believing the safety myth, and then keeping secret to yourself. Worries. We have a handy pop psychological word for that, denial, right? Denial gets us loose. I mean, it's, it is true. <laughs> and I'm thinking that when Jeff gave us secrecy this morning as one of the prime characteristics of the nuclear industrial complex, we also need to think about secrecy not only on the part of the government or the corporation, of uh, local people who promote it, but the secrecy on the part of those of us who become subjected to it of alienation from one's own anxieties, the effort it takes to keep on denying something you, success, you suspect. It is also something I think that, that um, Robert Chavez's talk got at, that so often, so often we are asked to choose between life and livelihood. Again, if we're not all opposed to that choice equally, that's where there's a great deal of social injustice. It's a terrible, terrible balance, and there, there should be no need in the 21st century for anyone to have to choose their lives or their livelihood. And yet that's a question that's constantly being posed. Another kind of being off guard is that after the disaster, simply getting used to living with those conditions. Um, Akiko Yoshida today talked about, in response to a question, saying there are two kinds of people left in Fukushima. Those who would like to leave but can't because of reasons of their work or really financial constraints or possibly family reasons. And those who prefer to, leave, uh, to believe in the government. And I'm thinking that even on the part of the former, that those who would, um, choose to believe that what the government is saying, that they're in safe enough places, that they themselves must have suspicions, right? And that, that they are alienated from their own victimization. So there's that kind of being off guard, is simply getting used to things. And this is a hard one. I'm thinking that some forms of support, even, for victims might be a version of being caught off guard. I'll try to elaborate on that a bit. And I'm going to turn to um, somebody who's really been um, 
held a long stone for me and how to think about Fukushima. A woman, um, Guriko Muto, um, from Fukushima, who lost her own livelihood because she was living in the foothills of mountains, um, running a cafe and serving a lot of natural things. She is one of those people who began to oppose nuclear power after Chernobyl. And the reason she did was that she began to study it and she decided that every stage of generation of nuclear power, from people involved in uranium mining to people who transport it, I mean, who, who, and then the, and all the processes of milling it and enriching it, that somebody is being exposed to radiation every step of the way. And she simply could not condone not opposing that form of power. Now, um, this is, uh, I was really thrilled to see that uh, Kristen Iverson, in her magnificent book on Rocky Flats, quotes a part of his speech, which was given at the first major gathering. I think electrified everyone because it helped people feel what it was like to live in Kishima after the disaster. And I'm just going to quote a quick part of it, <clears throat> a short part of it, quickly, and you can find parts of it in, in the epilogue in Kristen's book, and you can also find the whole speech on the translated. Um, okay, quote, quote, caught between the campaign launched ever so quickly to proclaim our safety on the one hand and our own uncertainty on the other. The ties holding us together have been sundered in our neighborhoods, our workplaces, at school, and at home. How many of us have suffered and grieved? <coughs> like it or not, decisions are pressed upon us every day. To flee or not to flee, to eat or not to eat, it's a series of Hamlet-like questions. Um, to hang out or wash or not to hang it out. To make our children wear masks or not to force them to to till our fields or not to till them, to protest to someone, something, or remain silent. All manner of agonizing decisions have confronted us. And these questions are the ones that I think she's, um, she's to me, so helpful because she's not trapped by false divisions. So we have been divided by the forces by a government that refused to take responsibility, never mind TEPCO itself. And there are people in Fukushima um, who will say, for all the problems with the Soviet Union, that a compulsory evacuation three days later is something that could have helped us. It could have helped, for example, in families where the father and mother generation, even the father might have wanted to leave, but the mother-in-law says, no, I've got to stay here. It could have cut down on some of those intra-family disputes because of the government orders you to be. But of course, the government didn't want to pay that much money or take such responsibility. Um, so these divisions that, has, that have been produced in Fukushima are overlaid and aggravating what was already uh, uh, an acute economic divide in Japan. Japan, I would say, in the late 1990s, had the lowest income gap of the G7, and now the G8. Know, the richest countries in the world, um, between the highest income earners and the lowest. And by 2005, I think it was second only to the United States. And I have read since then that in some, by some indices, inequality in Japan exceeds that of the United States, which is a major achievement you have to right? uh, to show greater inequality than the United States. And, and it's tragic because what Japan had achieved post-war was a widespread middle-class society. Now, middle-class is not everything, but it's a lot. Um, okay, so the kinds of divisions between the communities that site plans, house waste, and their interests, economic development, employment, although that is, has been exaggerated too, it's obviously a factor in the United States as well, between those places that produce the electricity and those that consume it became, became a very big deal after Fukushima as Tokyoites, some of them, felt with a pang that the people in, in northern Japan and Fukushima were not the beneficiaries of this electricity. They were, it was being generated for Tokyoites, but it would be too dangerous to have a nuclear power plant in Tokyo. Between those who can afford relative safety and those who can't, between those who can um, get by safe food and those who can't. Um, I'll try to give examples from my direct experience, what people have told me directly. A niece of a friend with a baby 
was so furious at all the, the rich people buying up the food grown um, from Osaka West that she decided she was not going to worry at all. She was just going to eat whatever food she could buy that was affordable. And my friend said, well, what about the babies? It's all the babies the same, too. We're just not going to work. So not being able to, not having choices can lead to that state of just coming into your, your you can, you, she at least had the energy to be angry. You can just become indifferent from your hopelessness. A friend of mine whose husband runs, um, uh, it's a K through, no, it was just a middle school through college, and found after Fukushima that so many parents from Fukushima were trying to send middle school age children to go to this school, which is in one of the metropolitan prefectures. And the husband would explain that, no, we have a policy that junior high students cannot be living away from their parents. He said, no, no, no. It's so, it, we absolutely have to make sure that our children aren't identified with Fukushima so that they won't suffer for employment and marriage prospects. So this, this I think, is a legacy of Hiroshima, is, is um, um, the marriage issue. And even, even recently, I've seen in the paper reports of Fukushima men complaining that young women don't want to marry them. Um, but a lot of secrecy, victim secrecy, took place in, after the atomic bombs because people were worried that their children would not be able to get married or be um, well employed. I once asked a very interesting, um, wonderful American historian who teaches at the Hiroshima Peace Institute, I asked him, so do you see this kind of phenomenon in, among Hanford downwinders of worrying about marriage? He says, no, Americans are in such denial about the dangers of Asia that there's no discrimination. I don't know if that's true. I'd be very eager to hear. I think what happens a lot in the U.S. is because people worry about property values. Right? That seems much more out there. Well, we don't talk about this because it will make the property values go down. Is marriage ability is a huge issue in Japan. People, people. Um, another friend told me that somebody, uh, one of his neighbors, had her son driving back from Fukushima on weekends, and the neighbors complained about having a car with a Fukushima license plate. Didn't want to be parking, so he offered his own parking lot. There's a um, there's a single nuclear reactor on the northernmost island of Hokkaido, which is sort of like my second home. And only after Fukushima did I hear that there was a rumor that girls from that area couldn't get married. And I asked a scientist um, from Hokkaido University what that was true. He said, well, of course, you know, the cancer rates, breast cancer rates are so much higher um, in that area than in, in the eastern part. So these are the kinds of um, divisions and um, tensions that are created and also secrecy among those who have been uh, victimized. Another kind of, of tension about staying or leaving, of course, who can afford to, and recovery. Um, lis listening to um, Robert Chavez and Charmaine Whiteface today and talking about something I knew abstractly but became, had a new power to me about how contaminated their homelands and have become, and yet how, how they want to continue to move their homelands because homeland is a meaningful thing made me think about um, my own worry and even criticism of people insisting on staying in Fukushima um, for the sake of staying. Um, and that, even though I know how difficult it is to um, get up and leave, and I remember screening a film, many of you may have seen called the Chernobyl Park a number of years ago, and students were astonished, so why do these people just leave when I thought, okay, your University of Chicago undergrads, you think that if you decide you don't like a place, you can just go up and leave. It's not easy. Not easy. Um, so I am well aware of that, and I just wish that there were, there were systematic government support for allowing people to move, not just with their children, but their old folk to, to safer places. Um, but on the other hand, we get campaigns like support the people of Fukushima by eating their produce. Right? Support by eating. Um, and it also and it, it becomes particularly charged when you have organic farmers who have invested so much of themselves into producing safe food and then it was becoming one of the hallmarks. Like unlike China, Japan produces safe food. And some have given up, but many want to stay, and they kind of put all their life's determination into saying, I'm going to, I'm somehow, one way or another, I'm going to produce safe food. 
And, 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 and as a, a great graduate student in sociology, as one of your servers tonight, has taught me to think about, okay, so supposing that these people can produce food that's safe, that really is safe for consumers, what about them? What does it mean for these organic farmers to be working with soil in the contaminated areas? So we, we can't just be thinking of the consumers and their safety, although market mentality encourages that. Um, or, you know, festivals like um, this in Soma, the 750-year-old festival of chasing wild horses, was revived almost in full scale this year. Now, you think about it. Right? These horses, a number of those who were big enough, were evacuated to Hokkaido. Um, in 2011. I guess they come back. Think about what do horses do when they're running? They kick up dust, right? There's no way you can have horses running along. And, and you're attracting crowds and on the one hand, it is, it is energizing for people. It's, like, it's the sign of this whole discourse of recovery, which the government has promoted like crazy in local governments too, is one that um, bothers me immensely because it seems like a version of cover-up on the, on the one hand. On the other hand, people need to go on living their everyday lives. What is it that will give them the energy to do so? Is, but, but, but this kind of having reviving athletic needs for students, all of that seems very, very problematic to me. Um, as does um, support by accepting um, irradiated Detroit's rubble, right? I, I think the city of Osaka just incinerated over three days at the end of November. Rubble. And the government, of course, but refused to, uh, to oppose this was made to seem like a NIMBY reaction, not in my backyard. But I don't think it is. What happens if you spread this green rubble all over Japan and incinerate it with very filters on bottom? Is um, you're, you're making no place safe in Japan. There's no place even to send children once you do this thoroughly enough. And I think that's a deliberate part of the government, uh, act on the part of the government, by saying it's unpatriotic, you're not showing solidarity. But it is also tacitly saying, look, the whole archipelago is now contaminated. You have no choice but to live with it. Of course, no one's going to say this, and I will not in any way be able to tolerate it. But this is what's happening. So um, I'm thinking, uh, or, or one of, this was a very amazing example to me. A friend told me that her nephew, who had evacuated to another part of northern Japan, gone back to start high school, has been instructed by his school to go to school. He commutes to school on a bicycle wearing a disposable raincoat. This, this is a school rule. He gets to the school, removes the raincoat. The way home, he gets a new disposable raincoat that he wears going back to school. What's being done to these raincoats, you know, with all these students wearing a set every day? Why is it considered acceptable to have children going to school in those circumstances? But that is, in another of those handy words that habituate us to the situation, the new normal. So I think this, the not wanting to know, the not wanting to acknowledge ourselves as victims is also a part of being caught off guard. It's a kind of um, alien, it's, it's alienation from oneself. It's, it's keeping a part, profound part of yourself secret to yourself. And in the midst of all this, um, I want to finish up with this, so if you want discussion, you can have a little bit of it. Um, on the one hand, it, sometimes I feel as if Fukushima had never happened, even in Japan, the way the restart of the oil reactor over what is now widely acknowledged to be an active fault. Um, all of that, and, and then the, the very loud voice of the economic interests have the dire predictions about what will happen. And because Japan, you see, has been in this 20-year post-bubble recession, the claim about what will happen to unemployment if we give up on nuclear power is very powerful. So amidst that kind of thing, I think there are also new kinds of ties the self-expression spawned by Fukushima. Some of you know about the skilled veterans service corps of retirees with technical backgrounds who want to be able to go into Fukushima to uh, spare younger workers uh, exposure. It's also the people in the SBCF are doing this. Many of them, you know, they rode the tide of Japanese, the 
the Japanese economic miracle, and it's a reflection of for many of them of what the what that economic miracle was for. And the uh, people like Rui Komuto, um, when we talked about earlier about the lack of accountability and liability, who are demanding that TEPCO and other responsible individuals be charged for this. Japanese judicial system is complicated, so it's a multi-step process. But on the one hand, that they be charged, but also as part of joining this legal effort, the effort to talk to people, which she's told me about, for people who from the inner part of Fukushima who feel safe and who feel that they are really been victimized by the harmful rumors, harmful rumors, another kind of double speak, um, and not really damaged, and by talking to them to get them to understand that they too are victims, right? To, to do some of the secrecy that one has maintained to oneself. So there's general election coming up on December 16th. I hope you will watch the results to see what happens. I think that the demonstrations over the summer were so successful that there's an enormous desire on the part of many to clamp down to see we simply cannot allow nuclear power to be questioned. So in that sense, again, we're back to nuclear power. It's a fundamental challenge to democracy. So my question, how do, do we redeem life, this, this life on this degraded planet and still our only home? How do we redeem life, individual and social, in this place that we have hurt so deeply? But, but which, when I say we, I want to say we are not all equally responsible and for which future generations are not responsible. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll take about three questions. We've got about five or six minutes. Then we're going to hear from David Kraft. Ooh, David Kraft. Is there an anti-nuclear party that has risen up from the masses that is running in this next federal um, election? There, there's a new party, the Future Party, that emerged last week. Um, you know, I was saying to someone um, that we just had a presidential election, right? In which I hear $6 billion was spent by both sides, and there's a part of me that says, what if the $6 billion had been spent on public education or housing, or, you know, school? Um, now, in Japan, educations are very short. They're announcing that you have like two weeks, a little over two weeks. And it's both of these models of elections are absurd. So the new party was just established last week. They are ahead of the others. And um, the head is a 62-year-old governor of Shida Prefecture, which is in central western Japan. Communist Party and Social Democrats and some other splinter groups are supporting, but this party has stated as its position, ending reliance on nuclear power in 10 years. So we'll see how that goes. The, the Democratic Party, the ruling party, so called, um, the Prime Minister Noda has waffled on this one way or the other. And, um, and now I think he's um, kind of getting back to saying in 30 years. Uh, but it remains to be seen how it is an issue I think that the electorate are keenly interested in. But whether in two and a half weeks sufficient organizations, especially as campaign laws have become more and more and more stringent to a degree I can't believe. Um, we'll see how much organizing can take place. I'm kind of going to ask the same question that was asked earlier today. But uh, we did see a movie about the uh, people who were organic farmers in mm. Japan, and that was really very sad. But is there some kind of biological remediation? I mean, I, if you eat mushrooms or algae or some or bacteria, I, I mean, you would have to do something with the mushrooms after they ate up all the. I mean, that's just assuming that they yeah. sucked up the. Uh, radiation, but is, is there any kind of work with that at all? I think there are a lot of experiments. I don't know anything that is substantially reliable. People do all, you know, there was a farcaria relying on sunflowers, um, right, and we still see them, and I think they're cheering, so, and that's, that's worth something, but, and mustard seed, yes, that's being tried too, but I, whatever you 
grow, if that is effective in, in absorbing radiation from the soil, we have to then deal with that plant. So, and then other, they're binding in the light that are being used. But I, I myself don't know anything that people are placing um, very firm, I think, as a good chance of being reliable. But if others know more about these experiments, I'd be glad to hear. Just to follow up on the discussion here, I think it's important to understand that um, radioactive materials are entirely unique in that regard, is that you don't clean up radioactive materials. It's not, you move them around, you absorb them and concentrate them and move them somewhere else because they are radiotoxic, in other words, they are their properties are due to their radioactive properties themselves, and that these properties are really a function of their half-lives and how they interact biologically in the, uh, uh, in the biosphere. And so there is no, um, unfortunately, there is no sort of magic or, or silver bullet that will somehow, some mushroom will somehow soak this up and you can move it. It's really, uh, you have to make terrible social decisions uh, that have to do with environmental triage and triage involving human beings. Yeah, in fact, I just learned, I, I always thought this word, uh, the Japanese word for decontamination, which I'll say, is peculiar, and I learned that it's not a very old word. It's, it's, it's the first character, the Sino-Chinese character, the uh, Sino-Japanese character is remove, and the second character is contamination. Remove. But before it used to, it was, this was used as just it's like snow removal. Well, snow, at least the pre-Fukushima, is very different from radioactive contamination. So you can see that the very language that's circulating in society is straining to accommodate and somehow make bearable this new unbearable reality. That sort of addresses my uh, question. Could you address uh, the way the language, culture, and uh, the humanities, the arts, uh, your specialty, uh, have been uh, brought to counter the lies that uh, engineering and science uh, have been used to cover up? Is that... Well, I think engineering and science are really indispensable, too, and I don't think I didn't that... say they're, they're not indispensable, but... They've been used to distract people from uh, the humanity that's been put in state. Well, it's, I think it's complicated because, because the Japanese government's recovery campaign, solidarity, bonds campaign, you know, my heart, your heart, that's a humanistic campaign too. I think it's a crock up, you know. It is, it's, you can be humanistically covering up as much as you can be scientifically. There's no guarantee that one discourse or practice or another is going to force you, is going to compel you to be more accurate and honest. I was thinking of uh, uh, perhaps poetry or art that uh, has come from... I think art and poetry can be deceptive too. They don't have to be, but neither does science have to be deceptive. They can both be deceptive. And, and you haven't seen that, uh, you've seen both in, uh, in Japan? Sure. Sure, and it's very hard when people come, you know, you know, a hundred-year-old woman has written her haiku or waka about, you know, how don't let your, even your hearts be washed away by the tsunami, and you know, and say, okay, you're a hundred years old, and you're well cared for by your secure middle-class grandchildren, great-grandchildren, people living on the ground, you know, may not find it so easy to keep their hearts from being washed away. So I, I feel that it's a, it's a delicate thing that we have to be, we have to, you know, we have to keep our eyes open and our hearts' eyes open. And, our, you know, we need everything. Brain, heart, we need it all. One How final question from Angela. It's a short one, she promises. From what we just figured. How has Japan managed with only two of 54 reactors? Well, isn't that a great, isn't that a, isn't that a great mystery? Um, well, first of all, um, I mean, it is true that fossil fuels have had to be relied on more. That's for sure. It's also true that Japanese citizens have gone on incredible campaigns to conserve 
you know, that really spread it out to farmers because they want to produce the government and the power companies law that they can't survive the summer without their air conditioning on all the time. There's that. And I don't, um, with, with colleagues and I, I maintain an Atomic Age website, University of Chicago, where we post Japanese and English language materials. Very interesting article recently that some of you may know about, about German concern, Eon, EO, and Aeon, probably. Um, <laughs> complaining that with Germany's new policy, the wind energy had gotten so cheap that, that um, utility prices were falling down, that they were going to have to report a, a loss to their stockholders. And that really made me wonder how if we're not, I really, I, I, here's one thing I hope for, is I would like good um, energy economists who don't take nuclear energy as a necessary part of the mix to begin with to start to do. We see signs of that in Japan. I would like to know the truth about what power mix is necessary, what happens to society, and I guess we'll write some of that tomorrow, but really from an economic point of view, success is concerned. Anyway, Japan has managed, and I'm sure that has really upset and panicked the authorities as well. 